Hello and welcome to you all. My name is Nick Austin. I'm the Master of Campion Hall here in Oxford. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the fourth and final of the Down to Earth Dialogues. During the COVID-19 pandemic, many people have been challenged in many ways. And I think we're conscious of the ways in which the experience of the pandemic could risk reinforcing policies that exclude refugees from seeking asylum in the UK. It could reinforce ways in which we provide a hostile environment to some of the most vulnerable members of our society. But it's also worth questioning whether there are perhaps new opportunities during this time of the pandemic to rethink our policies, our practice, to work out a more humane way of relating to those people who seek for asylum on our shores. During the Down to Earth Dialogues, we've been exploring ways of bringing together cutting edge academic research with those concerned with policy and with practice. And uh, we're exploring that especially today with the question of refugees and asylum seekers, especially in a UK context. And I'm delighted to introduce our two dialogue partners this evening. It's difficult to imagine any two people who are better placed to further that conversation between the academic uh, exploration of these questions and uh, the practical um, work with organisations working with those uh, seeking asylum. Matthew Gibney is the Elizabeth Colson Professor of Politics and Forced Migration at the University of Oxford. Uh, he's a fellow of Lineker College and he's the director of the Refugee Studies Centre. Matthew is a political scientist who works uh, on the topic of refugees, migration control, citizenship from the perspective of normative political theory and comparative politics. He's published widely on these topics, uh, including uh, editing the three volume encyclopedia Immigration from 1900 to the present. So welcome to you, Matthew. Uh, Sarah Tether is the director of the Jesuit Refugee Service in the UK. Uh, she also travels widely with the Jesuit Refugee Service in the Middle East, in East Africa, and also in Europe. Uh, before being uh, before her work with the Jesuit Refugee Service, uh, she was an MP for 12 years in a, a diverse and deprived area of northwest London, where she met refugees, began to hear their stories, and felt taken up by their cause. The host for this evening is the Laudato Sea Research Institute at Campion Hall, Oxford. Uh, which conducts multidisciplinary research for eco-social change. And uh, the videos from the earlier Down to Earth Dialogues are available on their website, where you can also find more information about the Institute. Just before we begin, I'll just mention a few housekeeping matters. Uh, the event will last 45 minutes. Uh, in terms of programme, we'll hear in turn from each of our dialogue partners and then hear a bit of a conversation between them. And then towards the end of the event, uh, there'll be a chance from questions from all of you in the audience. Please do write your questions in the Ask a Question, which uh, you'll find towards the bottom of your screen. And you can do that at any point during the event when a question occurs to you. And if you like someone else's question, you can click on a vote to elevate that question and make it more likely that that question will, will get some airtime. Uh, the event is being uh, broadcast simultaneously on the Institute's YouTube page, and you can also find it afterwards if you would like to rewatch uh, all of it or in part. So Matthew, I uh, now invite you to begin our conversation this evening. Thanks a lot, Nick, and it's uh, a pleasure to be here. And I'd like to thank you and Tim for organising this uh, particular evening event. Um, there have been many issues that have been able, sorry, there haven't been many issues that have been able to knock COVID off the top 
of news headlines here in Britain over the last six months or so. But the controversy over small boats of refugees crossing the English Channel has been one of them. The landing of a few thousand people this year has prompted some frantic headlines in the British media and, consterna and consternation in government. We must stop the boats, has been the Conservative government's continued mantra. And they've explored a range of means of, um, in order to do so, including wave machines, fences in the water, offshore processing, and even talking to the French, albeit about controls on departure. But why do these boats need to be stopped? After all, they're bringing people to safety. Well, uh, it, according to the government, the crossing is dangerous, and it's true that some people have died during the voyage, and the passage fuels organised crime networks, or trafficking, as the government erroneously describes it. Now, these are not completely unwarranted concerns, but the simplest answer to them would be for the government to provide safe legal routes for refugees coming to the UK. After all, tens of thousands of regular passengers typically cross the channel every day in safety and comfort. Increasing access to Britain is not what the government wants though. It claims that the refugees coming are not its moral or legal responsibility. They are France's. The refugees should stay in France and apply for asylum there, the government claims. Now, the government's position is clear. Refugees are not entitled to choose their country of protection. They should receive it in the first safe country they come to, which conveniently is almost never Britain. Now, even if one accepts this position, it's hardly the end of the story in terms of Britain's moral responsibilities. One might plausibly argue that Britain has a duty to take the boat refugees in order to fulfil its fair share of the world's refugee burden. At the moment, the UK takes only a tiny fraction of the world's refugees and far fewer than many countries in the global south including some of the poorest countries in the world. Furthermore, Britain might have a responsibility to the boat arrivals because it is implicated in the conditions that caused people to flee in the first place. It's surely not irrelevant that a large proportion of those on boats are people from Iraq, a country that the UK invaded in 2003. But should we even accept the initial position? Is it really true that refugees have no moral right to stay, to uh, have a say in their country of protection? Now, this might make sense if we think that the only morally relevant feature of the experience of refugeehood is a lack of legal protection. Then it follows that as long as refugees arrive in a place where their basic human rights are respected, they are receiving what they are owed. But this is clearly not the case. When refugees are uprooted, they don't just lose their legal rights, they're typically deprived of their entire social world. Refugees find themselves displaced from communities, associations, relationships, and a cultural context that have shaped their identity and around which their life plan has been organised. It's hardly surprising then that when they move, refugees look for more than basic security. They look for the best place to rebuild their social world. Typically, typically this means a country where they have family, ethnic compatriots, members of the same faith and opportunities for their skills. Now, I realise this is not a great time to push for a more expansive understanding of what refugees are entitled to in Britain or perhaps in many other countries. The sense of collective vulnerability that COVID has created may well be feeding into a politics characterised by national insularity. The British government's recent decision 
to slash overseas humanitarian aid seems to exemplify just this kind of trend. But might it not be possible that the vulnerability created by COVID can also connect the citizens of richer states to refugees in need? A few weeks ago, I listened to the radio while a middle-aged British man vividly described his sadness and frustration at not being able to visit his aging and increasingly senile parents in an English care home because of COVID restrictions. His story, which is mirrored by so many others at the current time, was heartbreaking and so easy to relate to and to understand. Yet few listeners would have connected his plight to the news story on refugees crossing the English Channel that immediately followed. Now it's rarely raised in public discussions of asylum boats. Most secondary movement, movement beyond a first country of protection occurs because of the, des because of the desperate desire of refugees to join family members in, um, in another country, to be with children, spouses and siblings that have gone before. Even when this is not the primary motivation, refugees often choose where to stop based on a desire to find a country that will offer their children the brightest possible future. This is as true of refugees from Nazi Germany in the 1940s as it, um, as it is of refugees from Syria today. In a very real sense then, the heartbreak of the man separated from his parents by COVID and the plight of refugees struggling to get into Britain by boat thus has a common root, the desire to be with family members. It would be naive to think that simply getting a more three-dimensional view of why people seek protection where they do will change the minds of policies towards, will change minds or policies towards refugees quickly or um, uh, or uh, or radically. Our current responses are not just the product of limited imaginations, they also reflect the kinds of political communities and um, institutions that we have built and the conceptions of membership that flow from them. But I do think that drawing out connections between our current plight in terms of struggling against COVID and those of refugees May, may have a role in chipping away at some of the current anti-refugee narratives whose main purpose seems to, be, seems to be to provide a pretext for, for excluding refugees. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthew. So some uh, thought-provoking questions on the connections between our own vulnerability and uh, the plight of many people during COVID and uh, our capacity to empathise, to sympathise, to feel compassion for, for refugees, for example, in their, their desire to be with spouses, children, siblings and so on. And I suppose it raises the question of how that uh, emotional experience, perhaps that um, that experience of sympathy can be translated into commitment, into institutional change. Uh, so thank you very much. Sarah, now over to you to hear from a perspective from the practice side of things. Thank you. I mean, many um, interesting things uh, opened there by, by Matthew, much of which I, I agree with. So I think we'll have a very fruitful dialogue in a moment, but I, I'd quite like to start somewhere else, if I may. Um, at JRS UK, we work with some of the most marginalised and excluded people in Britain today, and their vulnerability is deliberately manufactured by the state. It's deliberately manufactured by a hostile system that begins with disbelief, with suspicion, so people who have fled uh, violence and persecution arrive in the UK and then face a system that is simply unable and unwilling to hear their story and to recognise them as human beings, 
and as human beings in need of welcome and protection. And what happens to the people who we support is that many will then endure decades sometimes of destitution, living a very precarious life where they're totally dependent on friends, on charities, they may be circulating around multiple different addresses, who are um, uh, people who are supplying every basic need for them. And, and they will have built a, a fragile system for supporting themselves, constantly living in fear of detention. Those who experience detention never recover from it. Um, but they will have built a, a kind of fragile um, a network that keeps them going and allows them to survive. And what happened when the pandemic struck was that all of those fragile systems of support were broken immediately. It was catastrophic, absolutely catastrophic for people. Face-to-face -face services such as ours needed to be suspended. They, people were unable to circulate around multiple different addresses in order to keep a roof over their heads. Um, they weren't able to spend the night on a night bus if they're homeless, ho if their housing situation broke down. And so immediately a lot of people became homeless and they became hungry. And that was devastating to listen to, devastating to listen to people who, who were just really hungry and unable to, to, to gain food or basic shelter. So, so that I think for many of us, there was an experience of, of, of being hugely precarious when COVID struck. But for the people who we, who we support at JRS UK, the precarious nature of their lives already created this, this immense crisis. Now, we reorientated our services very rapidly in order to make sure that we could get um, basic cash and food to people um, and to work to try and um, piece together support to take people off the streets. But there was a really interesting response. And this is why I think it's relevant to this topic of, 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 of COVID and a, a kind of moment, if you like, a moment um, uh, where we may go in a different direction. Um, uh, and we, we appealed for help to, um, to run our emergency response. We found that most of our volunteers were unable to help. We traditionally relied on often quite um, uh, uh, retired people, on relatively elderly religious who were supporting um, people and, and immediately what we found was that young people came forward often who'd, who'd never had any contact with us before so there was a kind of outpouring of generosity um, but the other thing that took place was that decades of hostile public policy was for a brief moment swept away so people who'd been held in detention were the detention centers were emptied out people who previously had to go and um, and report um, every two weeks which is a process that that most people find incredibly traumatic. That um, that was suspended. Um, some of the uh, the systems where people had to travel to the other side of the country without any financial support in order to, to submit aspects of their asylum claim that was stopped. So there were all sorts of things that happened quite quickly that we we had begun to think would never change. And of course, one thing that did happen was that regardless of your immigration status, for a brief moment, people were housed. They were taken off the streets. And of course, that had to happen because there was a recognition that public health means all of the public. You cannot protect anybody's health if you have some people who are continuing to be infected, who are acute risk um, of, of, of serious um, illness and are likely then to, to need hospitalized treatment. So there was a moment when we recognized that the welfare of all of us was connected to all of us. And it was a kind of um, uh, a moment of realization. Now, I say it was it was brief because what happened over the summer was that that um, siren voices began again. Um, uh, uh, it began with with um, um, filming um, in some of the uh, rather rough hotels that destitute asylum seekers had been housed in, um, and harassment of asylum seekers, and videos being posted on the internet, and then. Of course, there was an uptick in some of the boat arrivals with the better weather. Um, and then all of a sudden there was a kind of overreaction and we were back into the land of um, farcical levels of scapegoating, just unpleasant um, scapegoating, but also ridiculous notions. I mean, Matthew referred to some of them wave machines and barriers. I mean, you know, crazy ideas, but they were designed to demonstrate our toughness and to demonstrate that we could get on top of um, uh, you know, um, people, of course, who were coming 
coming to Britain seeking seeking safety. So so we so we saw in the same year two sides of the same phenomenon. We saw a generous response and we saw public policy that responded recognizing that we're all connected. And then we saw um, from the summer onwards a shift in that policy, a return to aggressive scapegoating, a return to suspicious, um, hostile public policy um, of, of making a scene out of um, very vulnerable people and manufacturing greater levels of vulnerability. And I'm reminded really of um, what Pope Francis has been speaking about, of um, COVID as a threshold moment, a, a kind of moment where um, we may move from one era to another. But of course, in order to actually make the best of that, we have to choose. And I, I have in my mind all the times I'm thinking about this, that line from scripture about a choice being laid before you to choose life or death. And we have a choice at this point. Do we want the kind of society that may thrive, um, where human flourishing is, is, is a priority that understands ourselves as connected beings, where the kind of social bonds that Matthew was speaking about a, a, a minute ago as being very important to refugees are important to all of us. That recognition that our welfare of one is connected to the welfare of all. Do we choose that kind of society? Do we choose to build something built on fraternity as Pope Francis is speaking about? Do we choose that common humanity? Do we choose to listen to the story, to build public policy around that? to build it around that encounter, to be open to the idea that there is opportunity to be had from welcoming people, that actually our society is enriched by that? Or, we do, or do we choose the death option, the option that closes down our society, that treats people who are arriving here as people who are seeking to gain what we have? Um, people, are we, do we choose to treat them with suspicion and hostility? Do we throw all our resources and our money at crazy inventions designed to keep a few people out of Britain who might actually go on to contribute a great deal to our self-understanding and to our society. So we have a moment, I think, to choose. The question is, what, what will we do? Um, and my hope is that we've not already degenerated to a place where we can't recover, again, those moments um, of connectedness. Thank you very much, Sarah, for speaking so eloquently of uh, both moments of possibility, new possibility of change, and the contrary movements of exclusion and hostility, um, that sort of double-sidedness of the COVID period for asylum seekers. Uh, perhaps I can just um, invite uh, invite either of you, but in, in different ways, both of you spoke of COVID as having this double nature in terms of its um, relevance for asylum seekers. On the one hand, it could lead us to be even more exclusionary, to be even more um, to disadvantage some of the most marginalised people in our society even more. On the other hand, there were moments of hope. Uh, Matthew spoke of the experience of vulnerability that we've experienced as possibly expanding our sympathy, as changing our narratives, as opening our imaginations, um, as breaking our hearts and perhaps moving us to action. And, and Sarah, you talked about those sort of new moments of possibility when detention centers were emptied out and reporting every two weeks at the Home Office was suspended. And young people uh, with great generosity welcome people. So how, how, can we, how can we use this moment for, um, for hope, for moving forward? Um, what, what are the resources of this time for making that positive choice for a more interconnected social uh, vision of how we live together. Well, I mean, perhaps I could to start on that. I think, I mean, it it may be helpful to think of some historical precedents here, um, and one that I think is relevant because COVID, in some respects, has imitated what it's like for a society to be at war in terms of the kind of internal um, domestic cohesion in many ways, the kind of development of community, the idea of kind of fighting 
wanting in common and needing to pull together. And if we look at the, the history of war, um, there are often times of great social change afterwards because people do start thinking, uh, rethinking various kinds of social relations. And one example that we have of this is the 1951 Refugee Convention itself, which emerged at the end of World War II and put into place um, an, um, an international treaty that even today still serves as the main um, source of uh, state responsibilities in the international realm to um, refugees. So for me, what that tells us, because I think we, we've seen many different examples in the UK and perhaps other countries of outpourings of sympathy for uh, refugees, of, of, of kind of moments of connectedness, but they're not, um, Kosovo would be an example, Syrian refugees would be one too, but it's only if they're actually captured in law, if someone kind of seizes the kind of initiative in some ways to kind of entrench the principles around that, and that's partly up to our politicians, though our politicians are also subject to electoral pressures themselves, that we can capture this moment um, and make sure it's not just a kind of fleeting emotional identification. Mm. Thanks, Matthew. Sarah, would you like to? I think, I think I would say the first thing, the first thing to say, I think, is that COVID hasn't yet run its course. So, um, Sure, we, you know we we have the the great news of a, a possible vaccine around the corner, but we're we're a long way before the population um, population is out of the woods. We're we're going to be living under these extremely difficult um, uh, circumstances for for a long time yet, and the implications for COVID on our communities, on our families, on our relationships, on our hopes, on our expectations, on our sense of what is normal and working life, all of this has yet to run through. So I think it's difficult to, although I said that, you know, the year's been characterized by this kind of moment of generosity and connectedness and the sweeping away of difficult public policy and then a kind of re-entrenchment with aggression in the second half, a bit like a kind of boomerang effect. I, we're, not, we're not there yet on understanding what the impact of COVID is on any public policy, I think, let alone on migration policy. So I think that would be my first reflection on that. Secondly, you asked a question, Nick, about resources. Where are the resources? Well, maybe you would expect me to say this from as director of JRS UK. Our mission is first and foremost to accompany um, refugees and those who are forcibly displaced. And I think the resources that are, con that are constantly untapped are refugees themselves. They're the people who are excluded from working, from, from contributing, they're forced to live a passive life dependent on other people. They're the people who are desperate actually to contribute in some way. They're desperate to not just support themselves and to be able to live a life, but to give back to society. And I mean, I wonder if there is a, there's a moment to recognize that at a time when everybody's feeling intensely under pressure that actually there is a whole group of people with skills and resource who want to give back. And there, there's also their own, the richness of their own story and their own experience, which has so often something to teach us about surviving in this situation um, uh, and, and so much to teach us about what is right and what is wrong and what matters, what's most important in our own relationships with one another. So I suppose my hope is that we can make space for refugees to speak about their own experience, their experience of COVID, their experience of fleeing their own country, of displacement, of living in a precarious way over a, in a long period of time. Um, there, were, there were real insights for me, I remember, at the start of lockdown from refugees who'd spoken to um, an academic, uh, Dr. Anna Rowlands, who collaborated with us on a report a few years ago, where um, uh, they spoke then about the warping of time, the sense that destitution and detention kind of creates this strange experience of living in time. And I remember thinking about this and thinking about the lessons that they had learned and how much that had to teach me about surviving in that period. 
Um, so I think I think the resource which is untapped um, are the are, are the um, are the asylum seekers and refugees themselves who have their own story. Oh. Nick, Nick, can I come in and just say something else there, if you don't mind? Um, to pick up on a point by Sarah, um, because I think another resource that we have here is just that, as Sarah um, quite eloquently pointed out, we've seen in some ways what happens when we dismantle some of the um, very restrictive deterrent machinery that now operates, and the world has not fallen in. Even in the midst of this highly pressured situation, the world has not fallen in at all. And I suppose when you're dealing with a country that is quite as restrictive as the UK, the first question is, can you make things less awful rather than can you make things perfect in some ways? And there are lots of justifications for making things less awful. One could be the kind of... Uh, the fact that you can save money from doing so potentially because a lot of this architecture is um, is itself very um, expensive. Another is that it's just having no real practical effect except damaging people in ways that perhaps we can now feel and relate to. Um, and I think in some ways what we need are almost kind of uh, negative arguments rather than positive arguments as well that um, we don't need some of this cruel and expensive machinery, and we've been given a little bit of an insight into the, um, into into why we don't need it um, during this period. I think that point on expenses is very well made. I mean, can we really afford to keep so many people locked up in immigration detention? Can we really afford to brutalise people, most of whom, of course, are never removed? They're actually they return back to the community, but much more damaged than they were before. Can we afford to the to do that to the people who are also working in detention centres? It doesn't do them any good either. Can we afford to do that? Can we afford that financially? Can we afford it with the human resources involved? Can we afford to invent ridiculous schemes to do, to deter a tiny number of people travelling um, across the channel? Can we really afford to build wave machines at a time when we're already spending so much on trying to recover the economy? Can we afford to have so many people with skills? kept out of the workplace, who want desperately to contribute, who have untapped potential. Can we afford to do that? I think these are that that's one way to make one way to make the argument, certainly. Can I can I pose a question to to either of you to answer? Um, you've taught you're both um, uh, intensely aware of the political role in all of this, the question of law. You've mentioned the role that individuals, refugees themselves can play. Um, what about the media? Because uh, Matthew, you you mentioned both positive and negative aspects of the media in, in the reporting of refugees, that at times they can really, the stories can really touch hearts. At other times they can reinforce these narratives, which, uh, uh, which shore up insularism and uh, exclusion. Um, so what's the role of the media here and how can a, a more uh, fruitful narrative enter into the media that could actually support some kind of change? Um, well, I suppose what I relied on them um, in my talk is simply the fact that if we understand more about the reasons that refugees come um, and the um, why they may choose to come to particular countries, um, we're often in a much better position to be able to extend our sympathy and establish connections to them. And we are in a moment um, when uh, a lot of us um, our sympathies have been engaged towards fellow citizens. Um, now, the question is, what's the role of the media in that? The role of the media, I suppose, is by moving beyond um, and trying to avoid quite one-dimensional accounts of refugees, to listen to refugee voices, not to swallow the perspectives of certain governments and political parties that are not just scared of the public, on uh, 
in terms of refugee issues that I mean scared that they'll be punished for acting inclusively but actually do play on and think they can profit by very restrictive very negative securitized views of refugees as well so I think um, a view um, or a perspective in the media that listened a bit more, explored a bit more the voices of refugees, um, put names to faces, for example, um, that would be a big improvement rather than these kinds of headlines that emphasise undifferentiated numbers um, and, uh, and, and tries to uh, um, appeal to the potentially most malevolent um, motivations of those coming. I mean, I think the the media are not a homogeneous group. Um, you know, the, there are a variety of media, there are a variety of journalists, there are a variety of outlets, there are people who are reporting 24-hour news whose responsibility is to, um, to pick up what's new and to... Um, to react very quickly. There are also journalists who do longer think pieces, who do more investigative pieces. It's it, it's not it's not one body, I suppose. So I think that would be the first thing I would I would say to that. Um, I, I think there's also the media have a particular um, power during this phase. Um, uh, that it's important we recognise. Um, what we do about that, I don't feel quite so sure about. Um, we are not free at the moment to move around, to go and meet with one another, to go and hear stories face to face. Um, I run a refugee organisation and I am not seeing the refugees who we support every day. I'm not hearing their story every day. I don't have the um, capacity to um, sorry, my inevitably something's just popped up on my screen. I can't make go away. Um, um, at least I didn't switch myself off um, as I did in the. Uh, uh, no, you're still there. You're still still there. there. I'm still there, aren't I? I was just slightly worried I was going to press the button that made it all nuke as yeah. I did a minute ago. Um, but I think that you know they have a very particular, a very particular power. It's almost impossible to hear story at the moment except through that medium. Um, a lot's being refracted through social media, which is much more one-dimensional. It doesn't have the space for development of nuance, and that's very, very difficult. So I think we have to understand that, that most people are getting their views about the world funneled in quite narrow ways, and it's very difficult to educate and create any kind of space for encounter. The other thing I want to say is just recognising the difficulty of um, working with media, with people whose lives are still greatly at risk. So um, uh, we, we, we run a walk a tightrope often when we're, we're trying to, to use the opportunities that we have um, to um, create space where refugees' experiences are heard by a wider group of people, but we're also always conscious of putting people in danger when they don't yet have safety and the certainty that they have the right to remain. This is difficult. It's really difficult. And um, you know, the best journalists will work with us closely and listen and sensitively in order to portray that. But we also have to understand that they are themselves bound under other responsibilities to um, ensure that they in some way cover a kind of balance of argument. So this is not easy territory. OK, well, let's turn to some of the questions which um, uh, members of the audience have posted, beginning with David Packman's question. What we should we say to our members of parliament if they profess Christianity but support the deliberate hostile environment policy? Mm. I'll, give, I'll leave that for Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just the hostile environment policy is simply not compatible with any kind of Christian anthropology. It's not, it's not compatible with an understanding of the human person in community of a, of, of a human person who needs to be in relationship with other people. Um, it's certainly not um, compatible with any um, understanding from, from Catholic social thought. Um, and I, I think that's, I think it's pretty straightforward actually. Um, I, I, and I think you know, Christians should point that out politely. Um, uh, we should model what we want them to model, which is to correct them politely and to express what matters to us. 
I'm not, I, I mean, I would add that I'm not sure the government even supports explicitly the hostile environment policy anymore. Not well, sure. they've renamed it. I mean, in practice, they might, uh, <laughs> but in terms of articulation of the idea itself. Well, yeah, they've renamed it, but they, I mean, it, it clearly is continuing. I mean, there's, I mean, we, we we, we saw it was a, a pregnant woman turfed out of her accommodation that we were supporting just a few weeks ago. Um, we're supporting asylum seekers who are being removed under the cover of COVID um, before Brexit kicks in so that they can be removed under what's called Dublin regulations without access to legal advice. You know, we're, we're seeing all sorts of stuff that really isn't compatible with any Christian understanding of the human person and is probably not even compatible with our own law. Um, I mean, what we, I mean, I think what we have here is really the fact that government are not, uh, the UK government is not really committed to asylum itself. And so yeah. you have a whole range of deterrent policies that are really just designed to minimise access to uh, refugee protection. So you have on the one hand this, this talk about a proud history, but none of it really uh, makes any sense in terms of the kinds of policies used. What we have here is deterrence, pure and simple, that um, operates both at the border and inside the state. And it doesn't work, of course. It doesn't work. It's futile. Um, it misunderstands the human motivation. We have just time for one last question, very brief answers. Uh, James Conway uh, asks, how will Britain's membership of the Dublin Convention change with Brexit? Will the UK still be able to return asylum seekers to other EU countries as it does now? It looks as though the answer is no, but of course they haven't gone through all of the process of negotiating um, uh, bits and pieces. Um, so who knows where we will be? <laughs> That's my understanding as well. And of course, if it is no, then it will have to be individual negotiations with individual states. So in some respects, it's all the problems of Brexit writ large. But in the meantime, what they are doing is rushing through an awful lot of removals without giving people say yeah. access to legal advice. And that's really disturbing. I mean, really, really disturbing. I think we're coming to the end of our dialogue this evening. So I want to thank uh, Sarah for your contributions from the perspective of practice and the uh, political experience as well. And from you, Matthew, from your um, engaged academic position as well so uh, it's been a very rich conversation about uh, a matter that is really intensified during the COVID period um, so thank you to everyone in the audience for attending today the final one in our down to earth series previous vi uh, videos as i mentioned are available on the website or on the youtube page for the laudato c research institute um, and it reminds me, uh, remains for me to thank both of you once again, Matthew and Sarah, for your contributions this evening. Thank you, Nick.